if you look at somebody walking a grocery cart in a supermarket and they're dealing with morbid obesity, that you don't rush to judgment that that person is lazy, that person is uh, making bad decisions, because you don't know where they were two weeks before that. They could be the perfect version of themselves right now, mm. suffering from the previous version of themselves who didn't think the way they do now, the decisions that that person made, and now they're two weeks into their journey of becoming a completely different person and you discounted them because you saw the way that they looked. In order to be a masterpiece, you have to be a work in progress. That's for everybody. A very special thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode of the show. I believe that the best way you can actually take care of your body is to take care of your mind first. And that's where BetterHelp comes in. Right now, especially during the holidays, people tend to be more stressed than they should be. They're triggered. They're reacting to a lot of their old experiences. And being able to talk to somebody and really being able to relate is incredibly important. And that's why better help exists. That's better help, H E L P dot com. So you'll go to better help, H E L P dot com slash Dr. Lion. And what this is, is this is an online therapy that offers video if you want it phone and even live chat only therapy sessions. If you or someone you know is really struggling, please make sure you reach out to someone you love. If you are someone who is feeling down and really needs therapy, then make sure you get what you need. One way to be able to talk to somebody is go to BetterHelp dot com slash Dr. Lion and our listeners get 10% off their first month. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash Dr. Lion. Dr. Sean Pestouche. Yep. It is so nice to have you here. Thank you, Gabrielle. It's nice to be here. <laughs> uh, be, being someone who's worked with you as a, as a patient and my yeah. wife has worked with you, coming into the studio, meeting you in person is really nice. Yeah. Well, you're, hopefully your better half will come next time. She is amazing, beautiful, and a mother of three. All true. Yes, all true. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really glad that you're here today. You are somewhat of a pioneer in your field, and you are a chiropractor or were mm -hmm. a chiropractor. Um, and really, you founded this uh, company called Active Life, and it was really to create opportunities for people and to limit the friction of the everyday person knowing what to do as it relates to physical fitness. Yeah, you know, what it was, I can tell you a little bit of the backstory of it. I would love it. In 2012, I was running a chiropractic clinic after Hurricane Sandy had wiped the whole business off the mat. And I found myself having getting the opportunity to reinvent everything that we were going to do. And I wanted to catch up to where I was as fast as possible. So I sought out influential people who lived on Long Island within an hour and a half, two hours of me, and I would drive to them to treat them. At the time, I had no clinic. There was where was I going to treat people anyway? So I might as well go get known by people who have the attention of other people. That led to a type of visitation because now these people who were coming to see me were driving an hour when I had my clinic, an hour and a half, two hours, where they weren't going to come out two, three times a week. I mean, you need to come up with a different kind of way to treat these people in clinic. So came up with a three-day assessment where people would fly in. We had people fly in from Finland, from Australia, from you name it all to our little clinic in Island Park, New York, uh, to get assessed in a clinical setting and then to get assessed in a gym setting. And the promise was, we're going to identify what's holding you back and send you home with a plan so that you can do this from anywhere in the world without having to go back to the doctor to get out of pain. Um, that exploded. It became this thing where we had, you know, professional baseball players flying out. We had, uh, you know high school kids with their parents bringing them out because they're like, this stuff is bothering them. Uh, and it became very obvious that we didn't actually need people to come out in order to provide them with the support that they were looking for to get out of pain and get on with their active life. And that evolved into writing programs for people online, right? Because you can't get treated for three days and then have your problem solved. And I don't prescribe any medications. It wasn't in my license. I wasn't doing surgery. So there had to be follow-up. So we would start writing exercise programs for these people and lifestyle programs for these people from anywhere in the world. And 
it, it just, it caught fire. And 2017, I found myself with my partner at the time working with about 40 athletes at the CrossFit Games in the warm up area. 2018, I realized uh, I'm much more passionate about doing this than I am about seeing patients and owning a gym. And when you say doing this, you mean? Helping people online, helping people to reclaim their active lives online. So many people live this, uh, the story about themselves that isn't true. I have a bad knee. I have a bad back. Uh, I'm too fat. I'm too old for this. It's just, this is who I am. And that's, that's only true if it's what you decide to believe. So I found a lot of inspiration helping people like that. And in 2018, I left clinical practice. I left the gym, took this whole thing online. Uh, it evolved to be something where you help enough people and their trainers and their doctors start asking, what are you doing? So we started training doctors and coaches and then gym owners start seeing these coaches make a real living and they're like, Hey, how do I do that? So we started teaching gym owners and now we're in the process of opening our flagship brick and mortar location to embody all of the things that we've been teaching people right in Long Beach, a mile and a half walk from my house. That's incredible. Thanks. That is incredible. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what, was the inspiration? Oh man, there, there's a lot of inspirations. So the, the first inspiration, the one that kind of like I've told people before is like the, the key log to a lot of this stuff I think is getting bullied in seventh grade, Mm. believe it or not. Um, I got bullied. It wasn't a big deal. It was a one day thing. My father saw that I was upset and he's like, tomorrow you're going to go into school and you're going to challenge the bully to a fist fight. I'm like that. Did you? Well, yeah. I'm like, he's got kids my size. Uh-huh. Like this, he's a year older than me. Facial hair. I was in seventh grade, 90 pounds, soaking wet. I was scared. I was scared stiff, but I did. I went in and I was like, look, I heard you want to beat me up. So let's do it now. And he was like, no, you're good. But so after that, that upset me more. But after that, I, w- I, I just, I saw bullies everywhere and I, I wasn't going to let myself ever be bullied again. And I certainly wasn't going to let people I cared about be bullied. And when I got into healthcare, I saw people being bullied by the healthcare and the fitness system. The next trigger was I was working at Equinox as a personal trainer, and I had a client uh, named Barry who had ALS. And he had some joint pain and he had some weakness. And I took him upstairs to the physical therapy suite and I would ask them, What do I do with Barry? And they would tell me, like, Oh, if it, if it hurts him, don't do it. Uh, if he doesn't have the ability to do this because of range of motion, just work around it. I'm like, all right, maybe that's because he has ALS. I'll go do a bunch of research on that. Then I bring the next person in. Same thing. Mm. The next person. I'm like, there's no way that people just have to be relegated to doing less forever. There has to be a better way. So that was the uh, the big trigger to move it forward. Wow. In terms of pain, you had this aha moment for your your clients that mm-hmm. instead of actually getting them better, while some movement is valuable, you saw them starting to have probably mental limitations and subsequent physical limitations. Well, and what's interesting about that is I, I think everybody can relate to the idea of um, feeling limited in their ability to do something. Pain, physical pain, is a really, really easy thing to grasp as something that would limit you. What I've come to understand since I started working with people who were in physical pain in 2009 is pain is much more diverse than physical you know, there's an emo- there's a large emotional mm-hmm. component to it. And so now, you know, the way that I believe coaches, doctors, anyone who is helping somebody solve a, a real problem in their life mm-hmm. needs to be cognizant of all of the different kinds of pains they're experiencing. That's beautiful. And I think that that's going to make the listener feel really heard, whether they're in pain or not, because I guarantee you they know someone that has been or is. You know, you mentioned that you've worked on training up physicians and physical therapists and mm-hmm. uh, trainers. Where do you feel like the interface is now? Like what do you for mean by the interface? The, the current situation of what we're looking at. So we have the medical field mm-hmm. and they're like, okay, well, you should exercise. And I know that you're in pain. Go find, you know, like Some. train or someone and uh, execute on this. And then if you're not better, maybe we'll send you to a pain specialist or X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So- what you're talking about is, is basically what's the first principle of the problem that we're all dealing with, I think. And that is, you know, there's all this blame and scope creep that jumps into the medical world where people like the doctor just sees you and they don't care. They give you a medication. They give you, they tell you to stop doing it, whatever. And then they send you on your way. Doctors are bad. No, doctors aren't bad. 
um, the way you ask the questions to the doctors might not be the best. If you walk into a doctor's office and you say, when I play golf, my back hurts. And the doctor says, what would you like me to do? And you say, get rid of the pain. Well, that's what they're going to do. Mm. That's what you asked for. If you asked specifically, I'd like to get out of pain without taking medication. And I'd like to be able to continue playing golf. Is that something you can help me with? Well, now you've asked the doctor a more specific question that's going to get you a more accurate mm. answer. So that's, that's one part of the problem. Then we have the fitness world where people are taking certifications in a weekend. They're taking a test online. They're, the barrier to entry is so low. And then within the field, the standard of excellence is how many Instagram followers can you get? Hmm. And or how much do you care? Quote, care, right? Everybody needs to care. That's, that's entry level. So now what happens is the fitness world looks at the medical world and says, why aren't you referring to us more often? The medical world says, well, all of you say that you do it the best. You say that, you know, your methodology is the best. Your implement is the best. Your whatever is the best. Who am I supposed to refer to and how am I supposed to find somebody? I, I don't want to send, I don't want to send someone to the 19 year old kid who just got their personal training license that person is great for somebody, but not for a patient who needs real professional care. Right. And now the individual is forced to navigate the space. And everybody in the fitness industry makes promises that are, it's going to be fast. It's going to be easy. And everybody knows it's not going to be fast and it's not going to be easy. So that's where I see the bully. Mm. Because and that's interesting. Yeah. People leave. Totally. And it's like, well, because it, it's a, I think if you tell somebody something and they, they cling to it as a hope. And then they go into the world and they try it and it fails them. And then the blame is cast on them for not having high enough priority for it. They didn't work hard enough when they were doing it. They weren't disciplined enough. Well, then we've gaslit them in such a way that it's 100% their responsibility when, as an industry, we need to provide education to the client. We need to give them a reason to be disciplined. It, those are the things that I think are really missing. And how do you how do you foresee us interfacing that? I think that is that part of the work that you're doing now is being able to interface and improve that education and the standards so individuals aren't so confused. That's my life's work. So I mean, we I love that. Yeah, we you know it's when when in 2018 when I left clinical practice and got into this, it was it was me and one part time employee, and now there are 32 full time staff members at Active Life. Um, we wrote an 800 page textbook for the fitness coach to take an education that will take them 13 months long. They're going to have to put about 15 to 20 hours of work in every week. It's like it's robust. full time work. It's robust. Yeah. They're mentored because they need to be able to ask questions all in, in service of helping the person who at the end of the day just wants a professional to meet them where they are. So that's, and I believe when, when the medical industry sees what's in the, what's in the education, who the mentors are, the results the clients are getting, um, when they get what we call a functional diagnosis report mm. from a trainer for a client that they referred, right? You refer a patient to a trainer, the trainer does a full assessment, sends you a document back that looks like a medical report, but for training, that instills confidence. That's, and oh, that's incredible. Thanks. Um, how... How widespread is Active Life? Uh, if I'm being honest, probably too wide. Okay. You know, we're, we're, we have clients on six continents. Hmm. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we want to do it. We, we want to do an exceptional job for all of them. So we have you know, coaches who we're educating, we have individuals who we're serving people who can't find someone local to them who work with us online. And then we have the gym owners. And now we're opening our facility. Incredible. That's a lot of things to figure out how to market at the same time. Right. And, and the, even probably just to manage. We have managing it pretty good. Mm -hmm. We're constantly refining it and rebuilding it, but um, managing it, we, we do a really good job. Making sure people know it exists. That's a harder thing. And that's why I say probably too wide. I see. So take me through kind of a scenario of I see a patient and this patient, it's not just geared towards pain, is it? Is it no. geared? So it's also activity, 
longevity. Um, I don't know if you guys focus on body composition at all. So we, uh, I follow you. One of the questions I like to ask anybody in any industry that helps me to understand um, how much is this person actually thought about their own value is who is the person for whom you're not a fit, right? Because if somebody says, oh, anybody, everybody, anybody, I'm, I'm great for everybody. Mm. Well, then you haven't actually considered who you're excellent for. That's, that's a belief I have. Say that again. If you, if you think that you're a fit for everybody, then you haven't really considered who you're excellent for. That's brilliant. Thank you. And if you haven't considered who you're excellent for, then it means you're probably not excellent for anybody. Because what happens is all this wide group of people come in and someone gets a service that's perfect for them, but everybody else gets some diluted version. So we, we aim for the people for whom the fitness industry and the healthcare industry have no answers. So I'll give you some simple, I'll give you kind of the edges of it. Great. And have, I'd love an example of what that looks like. I'll, I'll give you oh, two very real amazing. ones who have enrolled to be clients at our flagship. Um, I won't name their names. We have one person who is 60 something years old, has hip replacement that's three months old, ha, was born paralyzed on one side of her body and had a stress fracture and I believe three of her lumbar vertebrae. She went to a medical doctor and they referred her to us for, for support. She's robust. She's, she can type like she, she can, she's, she's not paralyzed anymore. She's, if you saw her walking down the street, you'd be like, that's a healthy 60 something year old woman. Um, but all of those complicating factors lead to her not being able to walk into the commercial gym and just trust a trainer to work with her. They lead her to not being able to go into the group fitness environment mm -hmm. and do her thing. And frankly, they lead her to needing professional guidance. One of the goals she came to us with was, I want to be able to get back into pigeon pose on my hip replacement leg. We said, okay, that's not a responsible goal that we can promise you, given that you have hip replacement in the way you've had it done, that would expose you to dislocation. We, we won't support helping you towards that goal. We will help support you in everything else that you rattled off. So we're honest with her. The other side is another client who... 49 year old mother who has three kids, no injuries, wants to used to be a CrossFitter. You know, she'll, she'll tell you she's pissed. She never get a muscle up in the CrossFit gym. That's what, that's what was left out. And she just wants professional guidance. She wants to understand why she's doing what she's doing. She wants to feel like she's safe. She's being aggressive. She wants to be progressive and she wants someone who knows how to get her there to save her the time of having to figure it out. She doesn't want to walk into a big group environment and have to, you know, conform to what the group is doing. And she doesn't want to work with herself in a commercial gym where she's renting equipment. And she doesn't want to work with a personal trainer who isn't professional and career oriented. Hmm. Those are the margins of who we work with. Outside of that, to give you some example of what's outside of that, if you were like, hey, I want to have a really specific aesthetic goal. That's not a client we would take on. I want to run a 40 yard dash faster. That's not a client we would take on. Um, I want to get down to this amount of body fat. We would collaborate with somebody else on the nutrition side of things, the blood work side of things. And we would provide the exercise, the education, the mentorship and the mindset to help them do that. That's where your mindset component uh, piece comes in. And it, this is something that I think that the listener should know about you. You and I, uh, we we see eye to eye on many things, especially as it relates to the mindset, the drive, motivation. Uh, you and I were chatting before as I was putting together this book and uh, you said to me, okay, well, what are some of the things that perhaps the editor would like to change? And I mm -hmm. said, well, they want it to be gentler and softer in the way that we allow people to perhaps hold themselves to a lower standard. And when you're thinking about mindset for your clientele, how have you framed it? And, and before I finish this question, I'll notice and, and just highlight the fact that you talked about Hurricane Sandy completely wiping out your business. And house. And uh, all I heard you say was opportunity. Mm -hmm. Just to set the stage for... Um, you know, the individual who is at home listening. And I 
uh, back to the original question, I'm really curious about how that mindset bleeds over to your population. Uh, you know, it's funny because people people will tout methodologies, right? They This methodology is the best one. This methodology is the best one. And I think that what's allowed active life to be successful is that we've told people we're a mindset, not a methodology. We're the mindset that if if we're doing something and a better way to do the same thing comes along, we don't have to defend what we've been doing. We can just adopt the better way. Hmm. The mindset that I have that we've we've dispersed into the company comes from a lot of mentorship that I've I've sought out. And then the way that we disseminate it to our clients is by creating core values and actually making decisions by the core values instead of writing a bunch of words on the wall and then never addressing them again. And the one that the the the, the, the key log of the mindset that I would suggest in our core values is we say that in order to be a masterpiece, you have to simultaneously be a work in progress. And it's not about you, but it's still your responsibility. So everything for us comes back down to those two rules. The, the masterpiece one means what makes you imperfect is what makes you perfect, provided that you are aware of the things that you do well, aware of the things you don't do well. And you either decide to pursue improving on them or acknowledge that's just not a value for me. And you don't have to be great at everything. Mm. And then it also means if you look at somebody walking a grocery cart in a supermarket and they're dealing with morbid obesity, that you don't rush to judgment that that person is lazy, that person is uh, making bad decisions, because you don't know where they were two weeks before that. They could be on, they could be the perfect version of themselves right now, mm. suffering from the, the, the previous version of themselves who didn't think the way they do now, the decisions that that person made. And now they're two weeks into their journey of becoming a completely different person. And you discounted them because you saw the way that they looked. That, that is the part of, in order to be a masterpiece, you have to be a work in progress. That's for everybody. You know, in the training space, especially, there's a lot of what I like to call in unconscious incompetence. Uh, I have it. We all have it. I think it's rampant in the fitness world because everybody wants to believe that they're great at everything for everybody and they're not. The other side of that, it's not about you, but it's still your responsibility, is, you know, I'll give you an example in my own personal life. When I learned that, I was a guy who never wore a wedding ring. Never, never, never. Ne I'm like, stupid. It doesn't provide me any value. It doesn't, it makes my workouts more difficult. When I treat patients, I'm moving it around. It's just, it's annoying, so I'm not going to wear it. And my wife knows I love her, so she won't care. When I learned it's not about you, and it's still your responsibility, I realized wearing a wedding ring, which she never hounded me about, by the way. People should know who are listening. My wife hounds me about nothing. I, I stepped in shit, <laughs> pardon my language, with, with my wife. Um, it, well, it, I realized it's not about me. Why, why am I making wearing a wedding ring about me? Getting one allows her to know that I'm proud to be married to her. I trust her. I want people to know that I'm married to her. So that day I went out and bought a wedding ring, came home and showed it to her. And she was like, she broke down. That's so sweet. Thank you. So for me, it's that that's the truth about working with a client. It's the truth about working with a patient. It's the truth about even being the client. Thank you to Element, that's L-M-N-T, for sponsoring this episode of the show. I love Element. It is an electrolyte experience. How about that? I'm obsessed with their chocolate flavors. It is an electrolyte drink. It has a 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium, no junk in it, no sugar, if you care about it, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs, and it's perfectly suited for folks following any type of diet, um, well, most diets like keto, low carb, protein forward, you name it. Element can help prevent and eliminate headaches, muscle cramps, fatigue, sleepiness, 
all symptoms potentially related to dehydration or electrolyte deficiencies, head on over to drinklmnt.com slash Dr. Lion. And with your order, they offer eight single serving packs free on any order, actually. Totally risk-free. If you don't like it, they'll give you a money-back guarantee. No questions asked. So again, that's drinklmnt.com slash Dr. Lion, and they offer a no questions asked refund. And if you order with this code, you'll get eight single serving packets free. I highly recommend that you order the chocolate flavors. You will not be disappointed. Right? Like, yeah, you're paying for it. But the things that that person did, they're not about you. They're about them. And when you're, you know, deciding on the team that you're bringing in, how do you go about and evaluating who is going to be an appropriate trainer, potential trainer? Is there a screening tool that you use? What yeah. kind of so, thought process? Um, we've made a lot of mistakes along the way. Which is the only way to grow, yeah. unfortunately or fortunately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it really is. We're looking for somebody who is ready to work hard and be wrong. And, and, and that, that includes me. I have to be ready to be wrong in front of the whole team and tell them, hey, I'm sorry, I was wrong. We're going to do this instead now. Uh, one of our other core values is to have a team first mentality. So what that means is if you're out there for I, 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 you don't fit here. You know, if there's a problem with someone in the company, we're going to defend you publicly and we're going to meet and fix the problem privately. If a client, is really unhappy with a, a staff member of ours in person or online. Um, we jump to the staff member's defense and then we sort the problem out. We don't assume that because the client said someone did something wrong, that someone did something wrong when the last four years they've done something otherwise. Right. So we're looking for people who have that level of maturity. We want to be able to have vulnerable conversations I believe that the more time it takes to say something, to soften it for the audience, the more opportunity we miss when we could have just said the thing and then evaluated it and then made a decision about working on it. Mm. When So that's kind of like the the baseline for how you per, pick a provider or are open to one, number one on your team and number two as a trainer, the fitness space is really confusing. Mm -hmm. which is why I uh, love having fitness professionals on because it's, unless this is something that you've spent your life doing, it's really impossible to know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and probably that's similar uh, to medicine or nutrition. These, these things are really, really difficult. What I really appreciate is that you've put together a program, right? A way in which people can execute. How did you come up with that? Well, I think, Let's, let's go back a step. I think the reason why it's confusing is because everybody is saying, yes, yes, you should work with me. Yes, you should. everybody is selling. I prefer to think of us as buyers, not sellers. Meaning someone comes to us and says, I, I'm interested in working with you. We don't just say, great. You have a heartbeat and a credit card? Sign up here. <laughs> um, we make sure we believe we can help you. So we need to buy the idea that we're going to be effective for you. I think if everybody did that, it wouldn't be confusing anymore because now we don't leave the client to make the decision for themselves about who's telling the truth, who's being the most accurate. We, we can be honest with ourselves about who we can help and guide people in the right direction. And I'll, I'll share an example with you that kind of um, is one of the things that led us to, to there in 2014. No, what am I talking about? 2018. We had a program that we had <clears throat> been selling since 2014 or 15 called Bulletproof. Bulletproof was joint health programs. Here's how you're going to get better shoulders, better knees, better hips, better back, <clears throat> better ankles. To prevent injury kind of a thing? To overcome it. Okay. Um, at the time, it was to overcome it. It could have been to prevent mm -hmm. it too, but it was, we basically just took all of these elite athletes we're working with. What are the most common things we're doing for these joints here in templates? We got that to doing in excess of $50,000 in a month on 90 plus percent profit margin. We were cruising. And then one day I was with uh, my business partner. I'm like, let's take a look at uh, <clears throat> usage rates. I'm curious how people are doing in the programs. And we found that less than 10% of people 
actually did the program. I just bought it and paid every month, 39 bucks. Then I looked at, okay, well, of those who started, how many finish? And it was less than 10% of them. And then it was, okay, well, people who haven't finished, how many of them are still paying? Almost all of them. It was, we had found the number financially that was inexpensive enough for people to not want to cancel with a value proposition that was valuable enough that maybe one day I'll do it and it will be useful for me. And I don't want to forget that I have it. We effectively became the planet fitness of template programs. And I went to bed that night. I remember I, I didn't sleep well because I didn't like it. And the next day we killed them. And I was like, we're not going to, we're not going to make money like this. Uh, we developed PDFs of every program. We emailed the PDFs to anybody who was on a subscription. So everybody had what they were going to have access to before forever for free. And I cut $50,000 a month in revenue off the business because it's not how I wanted to earn. Then how, well, obviously that is noble. And I think that you only do things that you feel good about doing. Mm -hmm. um, what about now? In terms of how are the program designs done right. now? Is it is it individual? Is it for the for the so there's there's three different paths that people mm. go through. Uh, right now we're in the process of actually enhancing the what we call the RX path, which is you any of your patients who are dealing with they want support in a fitness world and they want it from a professional who's not looking to get them fit for the sake of being fit. They want someone who's going to help them hit their goals and then. Move on. What would be an example of a goal? I want to be able to play with my kid in the playground. Got it. I want to be Got able it. to, I go to the, I'm come up in the stairs in Penn Station. There are these two tall escalators and a staircase in the middle. I'd like to be able to climb the staircase without being out of breath. So the goals you're talking about are not, okay, I'm going to squat 300 pounds no. or you're not talking about performance metrics. We're talking about life. Right. We're talking about practicality. Too often uh, in, in the gym setting, I think we, we use the word functional to use things that look like real life exercise and they do and they have use. They stop being practical when it's, when, when you can't explain to me how it makes your life better outside of the gym to do that. That's where we stop. Uh, and that's why when I said earlier, you want to, you want a certain aesthetic? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Now it makes sense. Right. Um, everyday people, people who are like, look, I go to the gym cause I want life to be easier. That's, or they feel like they should yeah. and they, they want to continue on the path of being mobile and capable. Absolutely. So those programs that the individual will get there are completely custom. There, the person is going through a full month of evaluation similar to when I did it with you. You know, the first thing we're doing is we're interviewing them to see if they should be a client or not. Right, for sure. Then they become a client. Okay, great. You're a client. Now they're going to meet with their assigned professional who is going to review all of the things. What do you like to do? What do you not like to do? Reframe the goal they have. Someone might come in and say something like, um, I want to lose 75 pounds. Okay. Uh, how did you choose 75 as a number? Well, what would it, what would be different about your life if you were 75 pounds lighter? Okay, so you would look different in your clothes and all these different things, right? You'd be able to run around more... Okay, what if you could do those things? And what if you looked the way you're describing, but you weighed exactly the same thing? Would, would that be a success or would that be a loss? And usually something like that for someone is a, a moment with like, well, I never, I never considered that. And that's when we can start helping them. The weight isn't the thing. The hmm. weight isn't the thing. Somebody who has back pain, same idea, right? Like we're not going to promise to get you out of back pain. We're going to promise that we only took you on as a client because we're going to give you back the life that you wanted, that back pain was stopping you from experiencing. Mm. So those are totally custom. And what we're enhancing them to do is to include a formal education component for the clients. So we're moving away from being completely one-on-one -on -one to being our team supports you. Mm. And you have an education curriculum that you can go through and the opportunity to meet with whatever staff member is appropriate for you in the moment, someone's your point, but you might want to work with someone on breathwork mechanics so that you can change your neurological state when you get stressed. You might want to talk to someone on our team about your mindset so that you can be more forward thinking and less reactive. You might want to talk to someone about your language so you can stop using negation language and soft talk and get into being honest about what you want to do. 
that's how the RX division works. As far as the ALP, which is the coaches and the pro path, which is the gym owners, all of those the ALP stand, is active, active life professional. professional. So when they're in when they're in the education, they're considered an ALPC active life professional mm-hmm. candidate. Once they've graduated, they're an active life professional, Go and ahead. then they'll be an active life professional specialist when they finish their next level. Gosh, I need to apply for this. <laughs> we need your help with it. <laughs> um, so, and and the gym owners, they're 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 in pro path. There's no end to that curriculum, right? It's because we're we're a mentor for them. We're they're able to bounce things back and forth off of us. They're not earning a credential the way that the coach would. All of the programs were designed as a result of solving our own problems. And they they still become that. So, you know, I didn't have assessments to use on clients in a training gym. I would try to use FMS, Gray Cook, who created right. the FMS. Brilliant. Groundbreaker. I didn't understand it in a way that I could explain it to my clients in a way that they could understand it. So I needed my own. So we created our own movement assessment that mimicked what we did in the clinic and just explained it in a way that it made sense for a client instead of a patient. So for example, uh, a lot of people get told in a gym, you need to squat lower. Simple cue, right? Right. How many people evaluate the range of motion of their ankle, their knee, and their hip passively before they try to squat to identify, do I even have the necessary range of motion to squat to the depth this person is asking me to. So we just kept on solving our own problems. Mm. And that's where the foundations got built. That's like, it's a lot of nuance, right? And I, I think that's really important to point out because as a physician, people will say, okay, well, from a muscle-centric medicine perspective, what do you need to do? And I would say, well, I think that you should be strong. And in my mind, the way to get strong was, you know, kind of generic. It's like, You should be able to squat, bench press, deadlift. And the more I learn, the more potentially that that, it doesn't have to be that movement. It could be something modified as long as you're creating enough of a stimulus, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's take it a step further. Um, Squat, bench, deadlift are considered a functional training, right? They're they're functional exercises because free weights and you have to do it yourself. If we apply those to the real world, they don't look anything like it. And so I beg the, to, I mean, when I pick up my kids, it is definitely a deadlift. A perfect one, I'm sure. <laughs> perfect. Um, symmetrically loaded to him. I got over. one. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, I don't know how well, you do it with your well, three. Well, so, so, so there's, there's, there's some simple rules that we, that we like to follow, which is, for example, you, the benefit of doing that kind of exercise. Let me start here because there is a benefit and I want to make it clear that there is. The benefit of doing that kind of stuff and being able to do it heavy is the neurological carryover to doing other things. It's the increased motor neurons. It's the increased muscle mass that, that stuff works. What I see is that people chase diminishing returns in that kind of stuff. Yeah. They're deficient in other things. Yeah. And if we look at the way someone moves through the world, your spine is moving. Your spine is not static. So how much time do we spend developing strength with a, a spine that's dynamically moving through space? Very little. And how many people who have huge deadlifts, huge squats, huge bench are dealing with joint pain? Most, Mm -hmm. most. So when does it become enough weight where it's not the thing you should be doing anymore? And when does it become not enough weight that you have to be doing it? That's, those are things I'm interested in. Hmm. You know, that, I mean, that's so valuable for injury prevention and lifelong Mm -hmm. fitness. If someone is listening and they're like, oh, it's exactly what I need. Right. I, I can think of a handful of my patients how does it work once they begin to work with Active Life? So they they sign up, they go through the assessment. What if they're in California? Are there coaches we in have, California? Well, so first of all, yes. <laughs> uh, most of our client services are- Christine, I'm thinking about you. You better be surprised I'm listening to this one. Christine, but yeah. we'll, we'll talk. She should be listening. <laughs> I know. I we'll know. Don't worry, her. I'll send it to her. Okay, perfect. Um, we service clients remotely. Mm. So we have clients everywhere. They work, we, we have clients in California, we have clients in Japan, we have clients in Australia, we have clients in Europe, they're, they're, they're everywhere. So it doesn't matter where you are. If you have enough um, training age, that's really the, the, little, the little gap for us that we can't close yet from our in-person services to our online services. Can you define that for someone? Someone who's going to work with us online needs to be comfortable with, with exercising by themselves. 
without somebody else in the room with them. Somebody who would come to our facility in Long Beach can be, I've never exercised before in my life. I see, because they have supervision. Yes. They have intense supervision. The online client needs to just have four foot by eight foot available. Okay. And a body. So all body, it could be done all body weight? Yeah. And there are times when equipment needs to be brought in for sure. But one of the things to, to consider is how did you hurt yourself? How do you train now? Mm. The person who, for example, can deadlift, a, you know, 500 pounds and does regularly probably isn't going to get better without some weight. That's a person right. we're going to need to say, hey, you've trained yourself into this position. We need to train you out of it with a similar intensity. Someone who is sedentary or who, you know, has done yoga or who hasn't been a, a big exerciser, we can do it with body weight. Hmm. And then there comes a time when, okay, this is now getting too easy. We would say our scope of being able to support you is now limited. We need you to either get some equipment, join a gym or something. And then once they do that, do you provide a program or that's kind of like... Of course. Okay, you do. So you would, for the... Older training age individual. My mom. Well, older <laughs> wait, training wait, wait, age. Wait, yeah, older yeah. training age, someone who is somewhat physically astute, right? Mm -hmm. um, they could go through out of pain, right? Like out of their hip pain or back pain, and you've now loaded them up a bit or whatever, and they now need to go to a gym. You would provide a training program. Every single step of it, from Incredible. how long to rest to what to be thinking about while you're doing it to what to be thinking about before you're doing it. Mm. All of that. Uh, and it's not, I think a program ends up being flat. We could give them a program. We want them to think through their program. Hmm. We want them to communicate with a professional on our team on a regular basis, on a, on a set cadence. We want them to be learning. To be I, I want to education. talk about the learning piece. What, what kind of things are you teaching them? So I'll give you a really simple example of something we would teach. Someone says, I want to get out of pain. Well, what is that? How, 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 how are you defining what pain is? So we're going to teach somebody how to start thinking about that. Have you gotten a massage before? Yeah. Okay. Have you ever said, ooh, that hurts? And they said, do you want me to stop? And you said, no, it's a good pain? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. of course. So, so how, how do we differentiate good pain and bad pain? Mm -hmm. And so we give them rules, simple rules. And this is for a client working with us in person. It's a, it's a lecture at a whiteboard and we're going back and forth. For a client online, it's a Zoom call. And it's a one-on-one? -on -one? One -on one-on-one. And it's not pre-recorded? No. Wow, how, that's a lot of um, that's a lot of time and attention. Yeah, there's going to be questions that come mm. up, right? I wouldn't want you pre-recording my blood work. Hey, Sean. Well, I mean, like, I guess you could, but of course you could. Yeah. But when I ask you a question, like, well, can you go back a second? Right. You you can't. So, I'll give it to you really, really, really short and quick. There are four terms that change the way people think about pain. Insult is the subconscious intake of stimulus. Irritation is the conscious intake of stimulus. So now you feel it. Right, you move around a little bit in your chair. You felt it. You changed. Irritation drives adaptation. Irritation drives adaptation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my shirt is feeling weird right now. I just pull it down a little bit. I <laughs> adapted. It. Okay, got it. Right. Um, or I'm really. I worked out really hard. My body's going to adapt. Got it. That's irritation. Pain is a negative emotional response. Yeah. To irritation, mm -hmm. and it's made worse with more uncertainty. So what that means is. I felt something. I don't like it. I would define it as pain. I felt the same thing. I do like it. I wouldn't define that as pain. Right? Right. The better I understand it, the less likely I am to dislike it because mm. I have less fear around it. So the pain is less. Then finally, there's injury. Injury is the decision to stop. So people will say, I have a knee injury. I have a back injury. I have a shoulder injury. And we would say, well, you, you walked in here. Right, you you sat in that chair. So those those things are not injured. There might be a tissue in there that has an injury, but you have a squatting injury or you have a pressing injury. You don't have a shoulder injury. And that changes the way people start to think about it. Uh, that's interesting. Their shoulder. I, yeah, I actually hadn't thought about that before. Now you can fix it. Mm. It's not a part of you. It's a thing you do. And then we give them simple rules. So rules are how are you going to think when you train? Well, how do you know if it's the good pain or not? We have to make something that is otherwise very subjective as objective as possible. On a scale of one to 10, one being you feel nothing, and 10 being natural childbirth or placing a kidney <laughs> stone, right? Where are you at? 
less than five out of 10, we're probably okay. Is it getting better from rep to rep or throughout the day? Or is it getting worse? If it's getting better, we should probably keep doing it. Rest is probably not going to solve a problem that gets better when we use it. Then when you stop doing the thing, does that discomfort go away? If it does, you probably didn't just tear your hamstring. (laughs) Which, by the way, that is why I'm I'm moving quite a bit (laughs) because, yes, I am sitting on a torn hamstring. Uh, the next interview we do, we're gonna we're gonna take Mark Bell's uh, cue and we're gonna stand. Perfect. <laughs> we stand for our interviews. Stefan, you got that? <laughs> uh, and then finally, the last one is twenty four to forty eight hours later. Is there a focalization of discomfort? Meaning, can you go? Yeah, it, right here, it bothers me. If the answer to that is no, then you had a good workout yesterday. And what that does is. It helps people who previously were avoiding the exact things that they need to do to get out of pain. To get out of pain. Did you have an aha moment when, when you were doing this? I've had many. Yeah. I, I, I you know, my, my wife could tell you, uh, I struggle socially with people who are not really, really, really pursuing something of magnitude. Simply because I, I don't know what to talk about. Yeah. Because I'm like, th- this is so much more interesting to me than the Mets. Yeah. I just yeah. don't care. Yeah, for sure. You know, you, I don't know if you know this, but you have a really good reputation in this space. Oh, thank you. Did you know that? I hoped that. Um, people find you very much a connector and always willing to give and always willing to uh, talk about something or offer advice and it's really incredible when other individuals within your space also respect you. Well, I appreciate that. It's, it's good to hear. That's yeah. frankly, um, I, I'll give myself a pat on the back that's earned because for a long time, I had no idea how to do that. And it took some intentional mentorship that I got from people when I was in my lowest point to realize that I was the root of my problems. And to change that. So I have, I've told people like, if you were friends with me five or not at this point, not five, but six, seven years ago, and you were a close friend of mine and we haven't talked in six, seven years. Let's just pretend that that's a real thing. You've never met me. Wow. That's a, so are you reading something right now, by the way? I I mean, just curious because the kind of evolution that you're talking about doesn't typically just happen overnight. And yes, it happens with mentors, but I would venture to say it always happens with some kind of reading and studying to some capacity. Um, Maybe it doesn't. No, but... <laughs> it, it, it does. Reading, reading has helped. I'm not reading something right now. What was the last book you read? The last book that I read. Hmm. Turning Pro. No, that was not the last book <laughs> that I read. Funny enough, um, I didn't know that that was a book until I started hashtagging Turn Pro. And really? Was, oh, Damn it. Oh, my God. Are you serious? So yep. t- so Stephen Pressfield. Oh, I know the book now. Yeah. is the, <laughs> I actually thought that's why you were writing it. If anyone has not read this book, which, by the way, we should probably put that on our book club. Um, Stephen Pressfield wrote A Turning Pro. Mm-hmm. I have the. I uh, think it's called Turning Pro. Maybe it's, it's going. It's pro. called Turning Pro. OK. Yeah. Uh, I have The Go-Giver sitting on my desk. OK. I haven't read it. I haven't started mm. reading it yet, though. Mm. Um, the books that have been the most impactful for me is probably the easier way for me to describe it would be Fair enough. Uh, Blue Ocean Strategy, which is a business book about finding an area of opportunity. Uh, Good to Great, which is about oh, businesses. Oh, yeah, that, for sure. Uh, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Uh, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Mm-hmm. Those are, and uh, The Four Agreements and The Alchemist. I love those two books. And that's, um, those two books are amazing. Mm-hmm. So I get much more, the pivotal moment for me was, uh, I'll, I, I know ex- I can tell you exactly the moment I can take myself there. Are you surprised that there is a pivotal moment? No. Thank you to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show. And I am going to highlight one of my favorite products, and this is their protein bars. Level one, bring it on. They are so good. These are meal replacement bars. Tons of different flavors. I am loving the peppermint flavor as of late. And believe it or not, they have an amazing, yes, and I am going to say this, a vegan power pro bar. You will not be disappointed. They have a, a chocolate mint. This is so good. My kids absolutely love it. So head on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. Try out one of these level one bars. They're unique. They're low temperature processed, 
This makes sure that there's no damage in the, you know, in the heating protein fractions of this bar delivers high quality protein, super easy, no excuses. So head on over to firstform.com slash Dr. Lyon. I've been fortunate uh, somehow. My wife has really been a huge, huge, huge positive influence in my life. I don't know how I got her because the person I was mm. is not the person I am, <clears throat> but she saw something. Yeah. She probably saw greatness. I think that. Maybe. Yeah. But we were. Or she took a gamble, but either way. Yeah. <laughs> We were walking northbound, Laurelton Boulevard, Long Beach, New York. Uh, for all intents, we had made it, right? Like I wasn't making any money and she was making- She's, 50, a, she's a teacher. She was a teacher. teacher was she a was teacher. making 50,000 yeah. something dollars a year. Uh, and we were living in a one bedroom condo a, a, a block away from the beach. And I was working 17 hours, like 17 hour, five days a week and then a 12 hour Saturday. And then Sunday I was lacking presence completely because I was thinking about what I needed to do and nothing was getting done. And we're walking. And I remember white picket fence on the right side, fall air. She says to me, she stops and she's like, you know, I don't want to be a single mom. And she's pregnant. And I was like, damn, <laughs> I know what she means. Like she's not talking right. about leaving me. She's no, talking I get about it. not around. I, I understand. And so I promised her that she wouldn't be, that I would be present for our kids, that I'd be present for her. And that was the moment where I really had to start looking at my life and saying, where are the areas where I'm out of alignment with what I promised to be? And just started breaking those down. Then about two years later, two years later, um, we were still in that condo and I owned an event company. And the event company was like, one of the things I did to occupy my mind coming out of Sandy. It was like, I don't ever want to be stuck in a location. I want to be a business that can do anywhere. So Sandy hits, I'll go to California and we'll do it there. No big deal. And the events were big. And we had $15,000 saved in our bank account. And we did an event that underperformed significantly. And the event lost $27,000, 13 and a half of which was my responsibility. I had a partner. I came home, my wife was in the kitchen and I cried. And I was like, hey, uh, I lost 13 and a half or $15,000. Ouch. Mm -hmm. And she hugged me and she was like, look, I love you. You're my penny stock. That's what I told her I was <laughs> when she married me. And What a great wife. Yeah, she's really great. And that was like, that was the, it's almost like you get punched in the face, you bleed a little bit, you can take it, you change a little something. But then you get floored and like, okay, I need to change everything. That was the floored. And so that moment set me on a, on a path to change everything that wasn't aligned with where I wanted to be in life. Can I ask you a personal question? Hey. Do you think that that happens for a reason? I know that sounds a little esoteric, but do you think that adversity happens to shake someone up or you think it just happens? And it's what you make of it. I think adversity is happening all the time. And the, the reason, if you will, is the thing that allows you to see it and do something with it. So adversity, you know, you have adversity right now. I have adversity right now. But it's not the same adversity I had before. It's different. Until that adversity becomes painful enough and the outcome of overcoming it becomes valuable enough, I'm going to keep dealing with it. So I think the, the reason shows itself after you make the change. Hmm. I hope that made sense. Yeah, I, I think it's it's really valuable. You know, it's we talk a lot on this podcast about health and fitness. The other component to the podcast is what makes the person? What's mm -hmm. what's the why behind it, right? I mean, otherwise, listen, health and fitness is amazing, but there's always a story behind an individual and a reason that they want and care about changing the world. Mm -hmm. I see bullies everywhere and it really bothers me. Yeah, I see bullies everywhere too. It, you know, yeah. it's, it's, I, don't, I don't think the individuals yeah. who would be the bullies mean to be the bullies. Mm. And so I'm not... Really? I, I th uh, do you think so? Do you think that they, you know, don't, I, they don't mean to? I think... Maybe. I think perhaps. with rare exception, mm. they, they don't mean to be the bully. They believe what they're doing is going to help somebody. I think usually that's the case. Yes. 
And I think that if you ask them questions about it, they can find a way to justify what they're doing. I agree. As a greater good. I agree. There are rare exceptions who are like, I'm just here to make as much fucking money as I can. And I don't care who I burn. Yeah. Anyway. You don't care who you hurt or what you're doing. I think those yep. are the rare. Yeah. What I see as the bigger bullies are the systems and the industries that have become propped up. And then what you need to do to be successful within them because of how they're built. The, the best coach in America doesn't have an Instagram account. They don't have time for it. I, uh, that is absolutely true. And the people that are also really in the weeds, changing the world and doing this stuff, it's very difficult to be 100%. forward. It's, it's very time consuming and it's, um, it's challenging. But there's... I listened yeah. to your podcast with the gentleman who runs the lab about muscle development. Yeah. And he, Sam, he, Samuel he, Buckner. He made a great point. He yeah. talked about if I'm not in the weeds, right. I can't be agnostic to who wants me to say what. I know. So the the idea of social media influence, and social media is not to blame. It's it's the the coroner, not the executioner, if you will. Right. Uh is just that people are listening to whoever has the most attention. Yeah. The way you get the most attention is oftentimes by being the most valuable. It's oftentimes by being the most outlandish. Yeah. So it's not... Or creating drama or controversy. Sure. Which doesn't actually move the needle forward right. for anybody. But the the, the, yeah. bu the bully that I see mm. is... is Social media is, is one of them, but it's more like... The culture that, oh, we need to be thin. No, you don't need to be thin. You need to have a body composition right. that supports your life. Right. Oh, you know, I need to do abs. You don't need to do <laughs> abs. It's the idea that um, the fitness industry is already there and the medical industry just needs to pay attention. They're so good. You just need to pay more attention. What's wrong with you? It's mm. not true. And that's a, that's a bully of an idea. Mm. Excuse me. That's a bully of an idea because it keeps people stuck. It allows people to stay unconsciously incompetent. They don't have to look at themselves and say, where am I not doing a great job and fix it or say, hmm, maybe I shouldn't take that kind of client because I don't like doing a great job at that. Both are totally fine. And what ends up happening is the person who needs the support gets screwed. Because they are distracted or distracted by all the things. Because, because have you ever been to like a big event for the fitness industry? Yes. Okay. I've been to many and they're not all created equal. Most of the time, if they're for business people, not the end user, mm -hmm. right? Not, not the person who wants to get healthier. We're talking about ones that are for the industry. If there are a hundred speakers, 95 are talking about sales and marketing business systems and and maybe five are talking about quality of service and how to do a better job that's a problem <laughs> that's a huge problem i, re I recently yeah. i recently spoke at an event like this and before me there were there were some industry leaders who got asked questions from the audience of gym owners why doesn't health insurance pay for training right and the industry leaders in both cases organization heads presidents stuff like that it absolutely should, and we are working on that. I follow, and I get up on stage, and I'm like, I'm not going to make any friends. <laughs> um, the reason why health insurance doesn't cover personal training is because it's not valuable enough. Period. I'm like, and if you want to disagree with me, take yourself through this mental exercise. Take all of the trainers that you have in your gym and put their names on a ping pong ball. Drop that, drop those ping pong balls inside of a hopper. Now, I want you to picture the largest fitness influencer in the world. Let's say The Rock is coming to your gym that day and he's live streaming the whole thing and you're not there. Do you want The Rock turning the hopper to figure out who he's going to do a personal training session with in your gym? Are you ready for that? Do you have that quality? And that oftentimes, usually, leads to gym owners saying, oh, no, no, I don't want that live streamed around the world, except if they just want publicity for their gym. That's a problem. And you're going to fix it? I'm going to fix it the best that we can. You know, we're going to... For a long time, I avoided us using the word fitness. Really? Yeah. Because I wanted to be dissociated from that industry. I didn't want to be considered 
fitness or healthcare. I wanted us to be considered the bridge between fitness and healthcare. Um, what I respect about you and the way that you practice is you're not a sick care provider. You're a healthcare provider. Yeah. I, I came to you not because something was wrong with me, because I wanted things to be more right. And you helped me do that. You helped my wife do that. We need more of that. And so I don't expect to turn the whole fitness industry around. There's, a, there's, there's value to, believe it or not, Planet Fitness has a utility. It's $10 a month. Most people aren't going broke on $10 a month. And there are people who can only afford $10 a month who now have access to the same equipment mm. as which should cost them 40 or 50. Hmm. That's a value. I don't want to change everything. I want to create a clear enough track where people understand this is completely different than all the other stuff. And there are 14 gyms in Long Beach where I am. None of them can serve the client who we serve. And we don't want the client who they serve. Right. So we get referrals from other gyms and we make referrals to other gyms. Hmm. That's what I want. And the education piece that you provide for the trainer and the professional, where do you come up with the curriculum and is the curriculum always evolving? I think I got a, an, even an email from one of your team members about creating something. I, that was from me. Oh, it was. Yes. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So, so the edu we have, like I said, we have 32 or 33 full time now. And so the education comes from what is the nearest adjacent niche to what we're already really good at mm. that our our clients would be getting requests for. So for it, you you were talking about the gerontology course. Yeah. So our our core curriculum is 13 months long, uh 18 hours of video content, 800 pages of a textbook, almost a thousand test questions, a mentored hour every other week, office hour, a ton of it's a, it's really rigorous, which I'm proud of. Um we used to, Anyway, how many people apply to that a um, year? We we about a hundred at a time. Okay. We'll, we'll be You'll going take through. 100. So they they go through a. So so we have two. What we need to be able to do is serve the the, the coaches who work in the gyms that we support, and serve the coaches who are coming on their own. Hmm. So if you're a gym owner, for example, you're a Gold's gym, and you want us to build your personal training department for you, all of the trainers on your staff go through this education. Got Their it. promotions are based on how far through they are and how many Got sessions it. they perform. Got it. If you're a CrossFit gym, we're going to rebuild your whole business model and train all of your staff. And we're going to tell you these people aren't going through it. You either don't want them doing personal training or you don't want them in your gym. Hmm. Those are your choices. But they all get it. And so the coach who comes to us on their own, the entrepreneurial coach, is usually somebody who is just tired of having to tell people to work around it. They're tired of not having the answers. They're tired of working, you know, a job that pays them 20 bucks an hour when you include the programming time and they want a real career. Mm. So right now we're servicing right around 300, a hundred of them are the entrepreneur type, 200 of them are the in, inside of the gyms. Mm. And do you end up, um, sorry. No, it's okay. The education comes from, they'll tell us, I have a problem with this. Got it. It's not in the education. How do I solve it? We'll solve it with them. And then we'll, evaluate like we have these seven topics which is appropriate for a course hmm. and that's how we build the next one and this so that's a lot of material for sure a ton of material. <laughs> for sure is there one recently that you're most proud of or something that's just really interesting off the you know education on ones? your mind yeah you know yes it's a story that got told today and what was so cool about it was we have a wins channel on our slack and but what? wins. Oh, what, wins. What, like, what are the wins? Yeah, that you yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so for our staff and for our clients. So <clears throat> before I say this, I think that the, the stuff we teach about orthopedics, the stuff we teach about, um, you know, metabolic disease and things like that, that's super cool. It's less cool to me than the soft skills that make that education applicable to a client. So it doesn't, it's the old, the old cliche expression. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. You can't do that until you can empathize and have someone understand you understand them. So we, we have a staff member, Melissa Caporo, who gave me a message today that one of her mentees who is in the education, we've been working on staff being more vulnerable with clients. Hmm. So us being more vulnerable with our mentees, like being human, being flawed. 
she was able to do that with one of her clients. Her client got a light bulb moment and was able to do it with one of her clients as a result. The client who she did it with was a standard gym member not buying personal training yet. <clears throat> and when she did it, that person was able to open up to her about having a history of negative thoughts, depression, all this kind of stuff, <clears throat> and seeing this client of ours as a beacon of hope for her who might be able to help her through fitness because the other stuff is, is managed elsewhere. Hmm. For me, that's the pinnacle of what we do. Hmm. I mean, it's it's so unusual, right, to have the the interface between – you know, there's like the fitness piece, like go hard or go home, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then there's the other aspects. You know, what you, what I hear you talking about is a lot of personal development. It's it's We are a personal development company that's disguised, <laughs> disguised. as a fitness company. You know, I, I'll sh go hard, right? I love this topic. I've worked with Olympic medalists, CrossFit Games champions, professional, ba like I've done it. Yeah, yeah. And it was but, cool for my ego while I was doing it and I'm, I'm over it. Um, I remember having to tell some of the fittest people on the planet, you think being mentally tough is working out when you feel that way. I'm telling you, being mentally tough is re recognizing that you shouldn't work out that way today and taking that day off. Mental toughness belongs to people who make mentally difficult decisions, not physically difficult ones. You know, the, the person who shows up at the gym every day and works out at five in the morning and they're like, discipline. <laughs> you like working out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You, yeah. You like working right. out. Where is the area in your life that you're not disciplined? Right. Um, Do you have an area? Me? Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> I have several areas. Um, I am not disciplined when it comes to working out. What? I'm not. I okay. do it. I do it on you a regular basis. Yeah. But like... I do enough to say I was active today. I'm so driven for, for this problem we're trying to solve. I used to work out twice a day, an hour and a half a day, mm. each time. Now I work out 35, 40 minutes, four days a week, five days a week. Um, I'm not disciplined on my diet. Don't tell me that. La, la, la. No, no I, I've never counted <laughs> a macro. And I, I'm intuitive about it. I look at food and I'm like, that That seems like it would be good for me. And that seems like it wouldn't. Be. <laughs> I've, I create the environment that allows me to have less of a need for that. I source a cow every year from a regenerative pasture on Long Island. I get my vegetables from farmers. Like, yes, we go to Amazon Prime also. But the majority of our stuff is coming from sources that we know. So I'm like, I don't have to worry about how much of the steak I'm going to eat. I don't have to worry about these eggs. These are these are pastured. Mm. So it allows me less discipline. Mm. I love that. So where is active life going? Oh, like man. where I mean, what is the big global vision? You you want that one on the podcast? No, you don't have to no, share I, it. No, I'm not saying because I'm, I'm curious. A, I'm a, more than comfortable to share. So here's mm. the reason I'm asking is that the huge gap I see is exactly the gap you're trying to solve. Mm. Right. And I can see that I'm a clinician who sees patients. And, you know, I feel fortunate that I can refer directly to um, trainers that I know and love, mm -hmm. but I can't always do that. Yeah. And that is a real challenge. So, you know, there's this huge dichotomy between the medical world and then the fitness world. And then within the fitness world, there's there's challenges, right? For I you? mean, obviously within within both. So I feel like you're you know, you said it yourself, bridging the gap. Mm -hmm. Well, for the appropriate patient of yours, you should refer them to us. Not for the ones who are looking to be jacked, jacked and tan. And, and that's fine, by the way. <laughs> I agree. It's I totally agree. cool. Um, just not someone we would be world-class at helping. Thank you to Inside Tracker. Head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. In order to live your healthiest, longest, most vibrant life, you do have to know what is going on inside, hence the name Inside Tracker. And this allows you to take a personalized approach to your own health and longevity. You can get $200 off Inside Tracker's ultimate plan or 34% off the entire store. Just go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion for my exclusive discount code. Inside Tracker was created by experts in aging, genetics, and biometric data, which essentially means they're going to take everything together and you will get a report in terms of 
what you're looking at. So what are you working with? What's your biological age compared to how you old you actually are? All of this is incredibly valuable. Head on over to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lyon for $200 off that ultimate plan or 34% off the rest of the store. My long-term vision for active life uh, is scary big and I'll break it down for you. I believe ultimately we stop being the entity providing the education and we become the entity licensing the education to educational institutions. Uh, before we get to that, or maybe instead of getting to that, it ends up being free. So we're able to provide the education to the professional 100% free because large businesses believe their businesses would be better if these professionals were incorporated into their corporate wellness mm -hmm. structure, into their, their businesses. Because they, the people we educate understand how to help the person who is sitting in accounting who is 150 pounds overweight, who you're not allowed to talk to. You're not allowed to say, ma'am, sir, you're 150 pounds overweight. You're diabetic. Your blood pressure's through the roof. Your knees hurt. If you don't change something, you're going to die. And by the way, you're costing the company hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. HR can't do that. Corporate wellness can't do that. We can. And so ultimately... Our ability to prove that over and over and over and over and over again. We end up having hospital systems like Northwell Health saying, I want to hire 100 ALP graduates. We say, great, you're going to pay us for two or three years at 15% of their salary that you're going to pay them. This is the floor of the salary you're able to offer. How many would you like to put you in front of? Mm -hmm. So we get the demand from these hospital systems, from these big industries. And then we go fill them with supply. And we make our education harder to get into than MIT or Harvard, because when you get in, you have a meaningful career on the other side. Wow. That's, that's where this is going. Wow. And how much time do you spend thinking about this? Every second of every day. <laughs> that's amazing. It's, it's really, really valuable. Thank you. If you had to give a coach uh, one piece of advice, a fitness piece of advice that say didn't have access mm -hmm. to, your, to your course, what, what would you tell them? Find a mentor. Um, who isn't going to charge you anything and work with them for free. So the way you do that is YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, all of these places. Mm. Go deep on one person or one entity. You don't DM them and ask them for help. You don't email them and ask them questions until you've taken in so much of their content and applied it to your life that the question that you would ask them would be a hole in the stuff that you put online that would actually make them better. Hmm. Stop being too, so diverse about the voices that you listen to. Start focusing on the client who you're aiming to serve and let one voice live in your head for six months to a year at a time before you listen to another one. Hmm. Who are your mentors now? I've... I've run the gamut. <laughs> um, that's not true. I've, I'm fortunate right now, my lead mentor is a gentleman named Ken Andruko. He, I stumbled upon him after a podcast. The, the host asked if I was working with anybody and I said no. And he thought that I'd be a great fit to work with this other. Actually, I was at the time. I was working with Jesse Itzler, mm -hmm. who is also smart, really, really great guy who you should listen to if you're, if you're interested. Um, just, I needed more one-on-one -on -one guidance, not leadership that I could follow. So Ken has been the best person I've ever worked with at calling me on my own crap. Mm. Uh, in 2019, uh, he was like, why aren't we teaching gym owners? Would you teach coaches would be great for gym owners too. So I, I wasn't the best gym owner. I didn't love it. I wasn't amazing at it. I feel like I'd be a fraud to tell them how to do theirs. And he's like, well, you're full of shit. You would be great for them and you should teach them. So we started teaching gym owners. That's the kind of way he's able to talk to me. Mm. He also taught me that um, my job as CEO is to create a safe and inspiring work environment where our staff and clients can pursue a common mission. And that has been fundamentally uh, mindset changing for me in the way I approach everything. Because it's all psychological safety huh. is everything. And that 
is a new transition for you or? Um, it, as an intentional focus, yeah. You know, people. I think people think about psychological safety and they start thinking about flowers and nice language and just being like, oh boy, oh, you know, I yeah. don't want to tell you that you're doing something wrong. Yeah. It's not that. Right. It's not that because that's not a safe environment. That's an uh, untrusting environment. Yeah. Yes. If people have to worry about um, saying the wrong thing to offend somebody at yeah. risk of offending, the person isn't safe. So for us- And the person delivering the message- That's the person I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, that person is not safe. No. That is so very challenging. There needs to be an environment where where I can say, hey, you did a thing. I don't like the way you did it. And here's why. How can we change it? And not have someone be like, you criticized me. That's, that's a safe environment. Mm. They always know where I stand. There is never a worry that Sean might be thinking something and he's not telling. No, you always know where I stand. So Ken helped me with that in a way where I wasn't just blowing down the hallway, proverbial hallway saying, this is messed up. This is messed up. You're Did doing you used to do that? Not on purpose. Okay. I never, I had a mentor I had prior to that a guy named Dirk, uh, who was a member of my gym, actually. He's like, I got to give it to you. Treat everyone exactly how you want to be treated. I'm like, yeah. That's exactly, thank you so much. Someone finally sees it. And he's like, there's a problem with that for you though. I'm like, what's that? And he's like, uh, you're a fucking psychopath. And people don't want to be treated like a fucking psychopath if they're not one. You were like, uh, fair enough. Exactly. I was like, oh, you know what? I understand what you mean. I understand you mean that in an endearing way. And yeah. Like, cause me, for me, I see something like foam rolling when it shouldn't be done, there are times for it. But when you're doing it and it shouldn't be done, I see that as dangerous. People are like, how is it dangerous? Like, because you make it okay to waste your time. There's nothing more dangerous than wasting your time. Yeah. Lacking the awareness yeah. that you're doing something that is not moving you towards where you want to go and that takes time. Which I think you and I see all- Always. 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 I, I mean, I hate to use, you know, always or never, but the reality is, I mean- But you're always seeing it. It's not- It's not Seeing it. It's yes. the appropriate use of the word always, right? It's not, it's not it, it doesn't happen always for everybody, but it's always happening. Right. So I see that as legitimate danger. I see an industry that taught you to do that as a bully. And I see you- in danger of a bully being a victim. Hmm. And that drives me. Do you feel that um, some of the institutions, have you ever reached out to them? Like, oh, um, yeah. what are they? At? All of them. Uh, National Strength and Conditioning, all of, all of them. So um, our coursework used to have CEUs with all of them. It was a lot of CEUs. To their credit, they gave us like the, the max you could in a year. And since we built the education back up to what it is now, we're going back to them. I don't believe those entities see a problem. Uh, I, you know, when you can get CEUs for being a social media influencer and taking the course from them, that's a real thing. That's a problem. When you can get CEUs being a glute specialist, that's a problem. And both of those things come from entities like that. Hmm. I see them as a necessary evil. We need to have at least a minimum baseline. Somebody codifying that the information. Uh, but at best, they're a starting point. Mm. And then do you think that you ultimately have your own? I mean, I know that you talked about outsourcing or contracting mm -hmm. with other um, institutions. Do you think that you'll develop your own? Well, you Maybe, kind of have one. We, we have but, it online, yeah. right? But I, what, what I'm getting at when I say that is like Stanford will have an active life major. That's what I'm talking about when I say licensing the education. Amazing. Um, you know, you're not, not like someone else with an online thing. The, the, the way to make what we do better is to bring people to a space and have them live there. Mm. Like you went into medical school or you go to college. You can't, we do the best that we can to replace in-person experience. Mm. And I believe we do it better than anybody else in the world for what we do. But it's still really important is what you're saying, critical to have in-person experience. Our staff who are leading the charge at our flagship, which is Set to open on Monday. Oh my gosh! Yes. That's congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Thank well, you. we, myself um, and the family, will have to come check it out. You should, um, and I'll cook for you. They went through the education, and they are getting trained by us in person, ten hours a week. 
They've gone through the education. Mm. How could they possibly still need 10 hours of personal and professional development a week? It's the soft skills. It's the, it's the hiccup. It was supposed to work like this and it didn't. What do I do now? You can learn that over the years or you can learn that through a fire hose. Mm. And that's, I would love for something that has the capacity to be able to bring our education in, add labs to it, have oversight. As it is right now, we're, we're asking for 15 hours a week from people. That's a lot. Yeah. And then, of course, adding in laboratory data, you're asking for, mm-hmm. for, for more time. But I can definitely see the value. Well, the labs I'm talking about are like, let's bring in clients and let's train the clients in the lab. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. I see. So and not blood work labs. Not blood work labs. I, I, I want to outsource that. There are people who <laughs> yeah. are world class at that. Yeah. Uh, the 15 hours that we ask them to do, those are not all reading a textbook. A lot of those are in the real life lab. They're out making money working with clients, coming back to us and asking for feedback on how to do a better job working with the clients they just worked with. That's a part of the process. You have to apply it. Otherwise, it's just a textbook. Right. Um, but I just feel like if if they were with us all the time, hmm. we would have, uh, you know, you're familiar with the Navy SEALs. We'd have the Navy SEALs of the fitness industry. Yeah. That, that would be incredible. It would be incredible. When you hear people ask you, and I'm sure, I mean, I don't know if your, your clients have asked you, but I'm sure the, the coaches have, when they say, okay, well, wh- where does CrossFit fit in? Or where does Olympic lifting fit in? Or where do these other modalities fit in? Is that, is that a question that you get asked? Of course. Okay. Um, my response is for who? Right? Where does it fit in for who? Because for someone, if it's in right in the centerpiece, it's exactly what they should be doing all mm-hmm. the time. For someone, it doesn't fit at all. So this is what I was talking about earlier when I said, where, where, what are the margins of who you should help? I believe that if you mentioned CrossFit and you mentioned powerlifting, if CrossFit gyms and powerlifting gyms went after people for whom there was no need to change anything about their system, everybody could walk in and experience the perfect environment and they knew who those people were and they acknowledged it, they'd be far more successful financially. They'd have far better outcomes. They wouldn't have a reputation of people getting hurt doing them. All of that stuff would be gone because there's value to all of it. When you were, when you, now that you've started working with these gym owners and I'm sure that you've had, have you had CrossFit? Mostly. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. What is the the one thing that they come to you or with? Is there one problem or is there one piece of advice that you kind of illuminate for all of them? So when they come to us, it, they've, they've taken in a fair amount of content because we are not an easy thing for a CrossFit gym to come to because we're not, you're not going to stay a CrossFit gym. But that's what I, actually, that's the whole point that I was thinking about. So how, yeah. So what we, what, what we, what we, what we, they come to us because they're burning out because they look around and they, they're getting older and they want to create careers for other people who could take this business over from them because they have members who are canceling and with aches and pains because they've seen people in their gym who are still modifying the same way they were modifying two years ago and they want to help them get over that. There are people who won't sign up because they're afraid. They come to us to help them with that. Mm-hmm. And if they come to us and they say, I want to stay at CrossFit gym, I make referrals to other companies who, who are in the who CrossFit space yeah. who will make them a great CrossFit gym because the world needs great CrossFit gyms. What we do when they come to us is we create problems for them that end up being their solutions. So for example, we help them build a meaningful personal training department in their business. Most CrossFit gyms are not doing a substantive amount of personal training. Having personal training in your gym does several things. It helps your clients get better results when they want them. You don't sell to anyone who doesn't want it, Mm. but if they want it, let's get them results faster and better. It gets your staff paid faster and better. It allows people, believe it or not, who are intimidated by your environment to now feel comfortable that they can work with you one-on-one until they're not intimidated anymore. All of those things happen. So it creates career opportunities. It solves problems for members. And then what happens is gym owners find themselves doing 50, 60% of their revenue in personal training without their group revenue dropping, which means we've doubled their revenue. And most of it's come from something else. Then it's like, okay, well, we want to do more training, but we, this person's busy coaching class. This person, we don't have time, their space. I'm like, well, 
let's get that revenue of the ancillary services to 60% and then build a plan to cancel your group when it gets to 70. Cancel the group when revenue gets to 70% from other services mm-hmm. that are one-on-one. And then those people are able to experience a downsell experience. You don't need to do personal training forever. You shouldn't. Mm. That's a dependency model. So they come off of personal training and into autonomous training, which is where they get an individual program design delivered to them by the coaches who work with them and know them in a group setting. So they have the peace of mind that they're doing everything right because there's a coach in the room. That's the full manifestation of the model. And for us, that's how we're starting. That's what we're starting in Long Beach. That is, is that a common kind of model or is this no, a model? Really, I, mean, no like, I mean, that's, I mean, that's. It's, it's the model that it's, it's like everything else in our business. It evolved out of solving our own problems and solving okay. our clients' problems. So, Hey, we have too much personal training to keep running group class. What do we do? Well, let's get rid of the group class. And then, but then how do we, we still can't scale our staff's time. Well, these people don't need personal training forever. And we've been sending them to another gym. What if instead of doing that, we wrote them program designs and had them do them in a communal environment with peace of mind of a professional overseeing it. That works. So my friend has a, a gym like that, actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's called Oak Fit. In, Where is that? In Texas. Okay. Dallas. Yeah. So it just, it allows the person who really wants a high level of touch and guidance and professionalism to get it. Yeah. And, and it does create an environment where people are working, you know, within a system and it is, it's like fun for them. Yes. And it's not necessarily group, but everybody is doing their execution. Uh, they're executing their plan in, you know, scaled for them. Yes. Yeah. Where can people find you? Well, oh, this to that, it's not scaled for them. It's designed for them. It's designed for them. Right. So, so yeah. the, the difference between what we would do and what would happen in a group environment is the group program is written for everybody. So what that means is nobody's in mind. Everybody's in mind. Mm. You write the long-term group program. I've done this. You write the long-term group program. So in six months, we want our members to be able to do this. Okay. Back up. Now we're at today. Then Gabrielle signs up right in the middle of all of it. Mm. And you have this hamstring thing and some back thing. All right. Well, we're going to reactively change your version of today's workout. But it's still today's workout. For us, your workout was written for you. And you're doing it in a room with other people whose workouts were written for them. And it's being coached by somebody who coaches many of you as your primary, Mm -hmm. but not all of you, to make sure you're doing it properly. The people that uh, find this program Mm -hmm. are going to be really lucky. I agree. Because it it does, it it solves a lot of the kind of gray space where the potential is, is it puts someone... I don't want to say further back, but if someone doesn't know where to go, then they're spending all this time and money just going to a gym, which, again, going to a gym is valuable, but it it, it has a potential. What you're talking about is very transformative. Uh, that's the idea. Look, I mean, it's they don't get set back physically by going to the wrong gym necessarily. They get set back mentally. They get set back on time. Very and true. The way, the way I like to look at it is there's 14 gyms in our town. Um, if you're getting into health and fitness for the first time, and you don't know which one's right for you. I think it takes at least six months for you to experience something to decide if it was right for you or not. That means six months at 14 different places to decide which one was the best. So in seven years, you can figure out which gym was right for you seven years ago. You're not that person anymore. And so that's why I talked about earlier, if all of these facilities, all of these uh, services could be agnostic about who gets the client and passionate about who gets the client they should get, then everybody, we can get rid of all of the confusion. You're talking about standardization of... All of it. Yeah. Somebody with a hip replacement isn't going to go to the kickboxing gym and get what she needs. She shouldn't have to figure that out on her own. She should be able to call. Say, this is what I'm looking for. These are my situation. Are you a good fit for me? They should be knowledgeable enough to say, no, active life would be right for you. And then somebody who says, comes to us as I'm 25 years old, I want to get stupid fit. I want to look incredible on the beach and I want to be able to do superhuman stuff. We should say, no, you go to the CrossFit gym. And the person who says, I want, you know, I don't want to use any weights at all. I want to use body weight. I just want to do stretching and gentle stuff. Well, you're going to go to Pilates or yoga. You're not going to come to us, but we should be able to have these dialogues. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's critical and mm-hmm. it's, it's separate right now. Yes. But not for long. 
Not for long. Not for long. We're going to do it in an undeniable way where people are forced to pay attention. And I would love to support you in that mission. I'm down for that. So um, where can people find you? Easiest place to find me is Instagram at Dr. Sean Pastuch. Everything that I do, you can find through finding me right there. We will include all the links. And then do you have a newsletter or something that... I have a personal newsletter that I send out every week that um, it comes out on Mondays. It's meant to help people gain more self-awareness to what's going on in this industry and how that applies to them and their clients if they work in the industry. So I do have a personal newsletter that I communicate. And are you mentoring people? My staff. staff. I shouldn't say my staff, our team. Um, My job is to make sure that our team has what they need. Uh, Entrepreneurs reach out to me on a regular basis and ask for mentorship. I would if the situation was right. Um, But because I'm not looking for it, they need to be, they would need to come to me and we would need to discuss. What does that look like? Yeah. yeah. What what are they looking to get from it? Um, You know, I wouldn't want, I'll I'll explain to you. I wouldn't want to work with somebody who is like, I need to take my revenue from here to there. Not, not my thing. What I would help you do would do that, but I don't want to work with someone who that's, that's the thought process. Mm. It's a reasonable thought process. I'm not going to help you with marketing, right? We're not, I'm not getting the nitty gritty. Someone who would be appropriate, who is not a client of Active Life to work with me personally, Mm -hmm. would be an entrepreneur who recognizes I need to up-level my personal development so that I can be a better husband, father, business leader for all the people who depend on me. Someone who would come to me with that kind of a mindset would make more money, I believe, as a result of Mm -hmm. those changes, and I'd be interested in working with them essentially becoming the best version or the in-process version of oneself. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. 